All right, dear friends. So as Sir correctly said that, um, you know, uh, being a forensic scientist and serving a national law school is uh, not only a proud and amazed moment, uh, and it is somewhat challenging also. Because uh, as an expert, you might face a cross-examination in a rare occasions. But uh, teaching law students, you face uh, cross-examination almost every day. And uh, that uh, gives you a preparedness for everything and uh, to look into uh, this uh, subject with a different angle. So here I would try to present my views uh, pertaining to the legal knowledge that uh, I have acquired while teaching law students. And uh, before I begin my presentation, I would uh, 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 talk about one disclaimer here that uh, the presentation is solely for the educational purpose and uh, the statement facts and opinions which are expressed in this pre presentation are completely mine. And that has no link with my organization. And the law being very uh, dynamic in nature, it keeps on updating and upgrading widely. And uh, so uh, whatever I might be presenting today, uh, may not be the same tomorrow. So let us see in the broader embed of uh, legal and scientific manner. So firstly, I would begin my presentation uh, with a quote that uh, the science of fingerprint identification has reached a state of perfection and thus assumes a significant role in day-to-day -day administration of justice. So friends, when we talk about this, uh, it is not only me who is talking about this particular quote, but we have certain other evidences which would support my statement in my future slides. And with this, I would say that uh, when we talk about fingerprint in law, it is uh, on many occasions we have heard and seen the instances. The first occasion wherein Rai Bahadur Shri H.T. Bose mentioned in his book that fingerprint companion that is related to fingerprints are self-signature subject to no fault of observation or clerical error and persistent throughout the life. So when we talk about this, another important question comes to the mind. So what is that? So friends, meet my friend Kunal. He says that, uh, ma'am, is it a fingerprint, an art or a science? So friends, when we talk about this particular question, we have already uh, learned about the answer in our first session. But uh, does the judiciary also recognizes this? So friends, yes, I would state my answer pertaining to the same. That is, yes, judiciary also recognizes this. So judiciary says, and uh, it is quoted in State versus S.J. Chaudhary, and the Constitution bench of Supreme Court has held that each of the words that is science and art has to be constructed in the broader sense to include within its ambit the opinion of an expert in each branch of these subjects whenever the court has to inform or form any opinion needs to point out and significantly it needs to focus and structureize more on the skills. And so in this terms, Court really defines that whenever the need arises, the science can be taken into the consideration of an art and art can be taken into the consideration of a science. And the word science is not only confined to the nature of physics or life sciences, and it includes broadly the field of systemized knowledge of intellectual inquiries. So with this friends, uh, Kunal got his tentative answer, but he was still not very satisfied. He said, ma'am, so can we do one thing that, can we say that all the fingerprint opinions are widely accepted? So how to justify this? So for this, I quoted him to the early reference of uh, the expert opinion. So the early re uh, reference of expert opinion talks about fingerprints in any legal report that was first defined in the act that is uh, evidence act. Now, how it has been defined? Section 45 reads that when the court has to form any opinion upon a point of foreign law or a science or an art or identity of handwriting or fingerprint expressions, the opinion upon the point of person specially skilled in such foreign law 
science or the art, handwriting or fingerprint impressions are relevant fact. Such persons are called experts. So then what is the question? Question is that, can I be considered as expert if I have a particular skills? So uh, again, that's a tricky question. We will try to uh, answer that in the future slides. So again, he points out the question that, ma'am, in that case, what was the first uh, conviction and when was the first conviction made in India? So we all are aware about this. So I'm not going into much detail related to the same. That was the first conviction in India that is in 1897. Now, again, he raises a question that, uh, ma'am, can we say that uh, the fingerprint is a perfect science, which I just quoted before a uh, couple of the seconds. So uh, being a law student, he does not uh, understand anything without the facts, and that is good enough. So for the purpose of producing facts in front of him, I quoted a judgment, Emperor versus Sahadev. In this, it was mentioned that no further evidence was necessary to provide that that were made by the same finger if it is proven by the competent expert with the help of expert testimony. He was somewhat convinced, but still he had doubts. So he said, is it the same position when we talk about in different countries? Um, well, I said, uh, no, it may not be the same. So he asks, what is the position in different jurisdictions? I said, let us see. In England, fingerprint evidence was received and upheld in early cases. It was in 1907. Testimony to effect that defendant fingerprints were found on window and the burglar premises. The court was referred in Coleman versus Lex uh, and it was held. And uh, again, it was supported by another judgment in 1909 that is in Re Castillon. Now, he says that, fine, madam, I, I have learned about England. How about other countries? So I told him, in Australia, in 1912, the Supreme Court of Victoria gave an affirmative answer to the question of Sessions Court as to whether the evidence of an fingerprint can be considered as an identity or whether it depends on any further action. So the court defined here in the case Parker versus relax, that is the comparison of fingerprint only was sufficient to support a conviction. So that's why friends, if you remember in the beginning, I said that it can be solely determined. So I have a supporting answer to his query now. But he says that what about federal courts? I said, fine, wait, I'll give you a perfect answer related to the same. So in United States, the first conviction on fingerprint evidence was obtained in 1906 and in New York, but the decision was not passed upon by appellate court. How it was passed, uh, the case spoke about uh, the things related to the history of fingerprint system. It was posted on May 2, 1906, and it was in Evening Post of New York, announced one article headed by fullest lesson from India, and according to the report, uh, the was convicted and sentenced to seven years in imprisonment. So this was the first ever mechanism which was tackled in United States. Now, he further stated that, okay, so do we think that uh, it is enough and serves as an independent matter? So again, to answer his query, I said that, in 1911, by Illinois Supreme Court, the defendant argued that fingerprint evidence is a class of testimony not admissible under the common law rules of evidence. And since there was no Illinois statute authorizing to this particular junction, there needs to be a cross-examination. So Justice Carter, in and his exhaustive opinion, stated that even though it may not be of independent strength, it is admissible with other evidences and as a means of identification as and tending to make out the case. So friends, what does that mean? That means that we are just not talking about fingerprint as standalone evidence, but we are also stating that if it is the standalone evidence or 
if it is in corroboration it can be used otherwise in both the cases now coming uh, forward uh, it was just then soon after this it was stated that uh, fingerprint evidences need not need any supportive junctions and it can be sufficient alone to identify a defendant now again kunal was very curious and he said that okay so you referred about that uh, the role of expert is very important here and testimony would also play an important role here and uh, how can you say this so i told him that the new jersey matter in state versus the law the apex court decided that it is held that fingerprint testimony present by qualified expert was admissible so friends now again we come to a debate that who is being called an expert so of course we will be answering to his queries in the uh, coming slides so let us see before this that what do we talk and how do we define about the situations in other courts so people versus roach now this was again a leading case which uh, uh, drastically dragged out a lot of debates into that in 1915 the matter of fingerprint evidence came before the new york court of appeal and it was uh, stated that all the matters related to fingerprint impressions were prejudicial error and all the conviction needs to be reversal uh, and replying to this the court ruled out the defense and uh, court said that uh, the defense had ample of occasions of cross examinations to the testimony related to the same so again the challenge was that uh, yes so the challenge is qualifications of expert witness so now are we all qualified or who is really qualified to go for expert witness so again friends when we see this we quote about certain judgments to support our statement now in the case leonard versus state it was stated that in us 5 years of actual experience in fingerprint identification work has been held sufficient to qualify a person as an expert so uh, can i say that according to uh, federal rules if i am having an experience of uh, actually 5 years then i am qualified as an expert to float my opinion so uh, yeah my answer would be partially yes but uh, let us see what about other jurisdictions so again now we come to uh, who is an expert in england so uh, it was again stated in r versus shepherd in 1993 a person must reveal his or her education training publication and the court may use all or any one factor of this on deciding whether the person can be qualified as an expert or not now coming to another jurisdictions what about australia in this case australia Clark versus Rand the case says that a person skilled in some recognized branch of study or organized body of a knowledge only then this can be called or a person can be called as an expert now again when we talk about this there is a challenging notion that is this requirement has to be imposed as additionally which is not insisted by any legislation here so either you need to study a branch or you need to know a sufficient knowledge related to the same now what is the scenario in india friends so let us talk about this and let us see this so in india somewhat we are a bit clear about this uh, because it has been supported in section 45 of indian evidence act and that refers that any person who are specially skilled in foreign law art and writing or fingerprint impressions are called expert and so we can define this so ultimately when we talk about this particular aspect we can still come to a decision and we can present before the court that okay i am being called an expert because i fulfill to these particular requirements now so uh, is it just enough or something else also is been needed So Kunal says, "Ma'am, can you please quote some of the examples wherein the fingerprint evidence is been given a vital, important weightage, and the experts 
opinion and experts witness are not been really very challenged and it accepted by the court i said fine i can determine my role with the help of two three case citations that is the fx court of patna determined that justice mishra stated about the amendment which was made out in section 45 it to include the fingerprint impression and uh, it showed a very policy and legislature to take a merit into the developments of the science in another case which was again serving as an important role by Allahabad high court ramdas versus secretary of state there is a difference in defining the term expert within and outside the legal system that means what kunal says that can i be called an expert i said fine if you can you have to abide to certain mechanisms now i i gave him an example uh, i'm very uh, you know perfect in making uh, chocolate oreo so can i be called an expert no so that means i defined in this particular judgment with the help of a quote that is i may be perfect in delivering or putting some skills forward, but not necessarily that in legal system, I may be defined as a legal expert or a forensic expert. Now, moving forward with the help of third case, I tried to make him more vigilant about who is an expert. Now, Balakrishnan Das versus Radha Vivit and State of Himachal Pradesh versus Jailal. The qualification is necessary to admit an expert evidence law does not permits any assumptions without the evidence on material posts so that means what friends ultimately the court wanted to define that even though you might be an expert but you need to prove or disprove your statements reasonably based on the scientific testimony and further the court defines that whenever an experts are called for testimony they need to answer like a witness based on the scientific methodology and need to guide court on the scientific terminology and the assessments which can be testified and in the previous section also we have seen about the evaluations related to the same now moving forward another friend of mine Neeti she said okay ma'am so what is about interpreting about fingerprint evidence in court using legal standards because we just spoke about legal standards and when we talk about an expert legal standards are very important so what are these legal standards uh, which we are discussing and talking about so this talks about admissibility of fingerprint identification in ju different jurisdictions so let us see quickly that how uh, other jurisdictions also entertains this as an admissibility now for an admissibility of fingerprint identification in US, it is quoted in United States versus Howard, the first significant decision in which court considered the Daubert factors for admissibility of fingerprint evidence. So what is Daubert factor? Uh, Daubert factor factors are based on five important mechanisms which supports a scientific investigation. That is first, friends testability. Second, it is based on publication and peer review. Third, it is based on error rate. Fourth, it is based on protocol for use. Fifth, it is based on acceptance in scientific community. So friends, uh, now the challenging question comes here that suppose if I have come up with a new technique for uh, you know, uh, developing latent finger, finger marks with the help of let's say silver nanoparticles would that be widely accepted or would that be admissible so us was a bit clear in this that if you want your technique to be admissible then it needs to meet Daubert factors and so the Daubert factors are stated herein let us see further what happened in uk so when we talk about admissibility of fingerprint identification in uk uk court noticed that uh, there is a permanency and uniqueness of fingerprints and uh, it was quoted in V versus Castellon and uh, in the trials it was held that the court can upheld the conviction solely on the basis of fingerprint evidences. But again when we talk about admissibility in UK there have been certain challenges and certain amendments. So what were they? So in 1924 
it was stated that minimum 12 points by new scotland yard were required to prove an identity of fingerprints in 1930 yard insisted that uh, 12 ridge characteristics were important and in 1988 association of health police officers suggested that there is no significant or no scientific or statistical or logical biases to come down to any sort of a minimum points but still they have come down to certain solutions to it which we'll be seeing at the later phase now moving forward when we talk about what is the situation in uk moving forward so in 2000 non numerical standards were adopted in england but guidelines shall be followed with some subsequent layovers so what were they so the experience and expertise of witness were important here the number of similar rich characters characteristics again played a vital important role the size of print on which we are relying on again played an important role and the quality and the clarity of a print also played a vital important role now coming to our home country what uh, what is a current scenario and what do our case laws states so friends when we talk about uh, fingerprint identification in india uh, again it has been widely accepted so far and there were certain and several occasions where court have even rejected to the clauses now i would support to where uh, it was an acceptance and uh, where it wasn't i would just put before you what was the challenge so when we talk about jalaluddin versus emperor court stated that uh, it is a reasonable deduction from experience that uh, no two human beings have the same markings in chintman versus lakshman it was stated by the apex court that it is scientific study an outlook on the problem that is required for an expert and uh, so based on that we can consider the mechanism state versus uh, state, sorry state of mp versus sitaram gajrat singh the apex court held that the grouped characteristics in narrow area and pattern uncommon six points or even even fewer may be sufficient to fix the identity now moving forward uh, it was again stated that mohanlal versus ajit singh it was held that uh, the identity can be established and if it is eight or even less than eight identical characters uh, the case may be appropriately fitted in jaspal singh versus state of punjab again it was stated that the science of identifying thumb impression is an exact science and that does not admit any sort of a mistake govind reddy the case again this was very crucial the science of comparison of fingerprints has developed to a stage of exactness and the famous cases again i have quoted here for the reference so few of them are malikat singh versus state of punjab to support the charter versus nadar again to support a charter and mohammed mx versus state of rajasthan which stated that further these prints were not taken in the presence of any magistrate so this rejects the starter that uh, that means it says that if it is not presented before the magistrate then it has no value to it and so for this we saw a very drastic or two kinds of contradicting statements by uh, himachal pradesh court now in one judgment that is uh, hp administrator versus om prakash it was held that the report of director of fingerprint bureau regarding the fingerprint can be used as an evidence and in another case it was held that hp versus v jailal the court held that report submitted by an expert does not go to evidence automatically and he or she needs to be examined as a witness in the court and has to face cross examination so on one hand we are saying that okay it can be considered on another hand we are saying that in several cases it may be considered but only after a particular and a proper cross examination now moving further there was another case and the question which was raised by my friend neeti so uh, ma'am how many points do i need to find for the purpose of identification so i answer to her query that uh, this was decided in the first all india forensic science conference held in shrinagar in october 
1973, and it was recommended there in exceptional cases, even when prints contains less than eight points, an opinion may be given. But minimum eight identical points in homologous sequence would be thereon required. Now, moving forward, uh, my friend Kunal asks, so is it a standard for all the jurisdictions, ma'am? I said no. In England, 16 identification points are required and in France, 12 to match two fingerprints and identification as an individual. Now, when we talk about this, we have seen that point counting methods also have been challenged by some of the fingerprint examiners and uh, judiciary because they focus solely on the location of particular characteristics in fingerprint that are to be matched. But this is not the case uh, which is uniformly applicable. This is under certain disclaimers and conditions only. Now Kunal says, ma'am, so what is an overall validity of fingerprint as an evidence? So I again, uh, you know, had a sort of an uh, mixed approach on this to him. The validity of fingerprint evidence has been challenged on several occasions. When we talk about United States, fingerprint examinations have to uh, develop uniform standards. And uh, when we talk about considering the same as an identification, uh, they are based on the examinations and cross examinations. When we talk about other countries, in some of the countries, fingerprints are also used in civil and criminal investigations, but fingerprint examiners are required to match a number of identical points before the match is accepted. In many of the countries, it is stated that it is not only about matching or not matching an identity of an individual, it is also about the concept of expert testimony and whether the person who is opining for the same is counted and pointed as an expert or not. And though we can say that when we talk about pointing out the counts or relating the things to expert, the methods have been challenged. And uh, some of the fingerprint examiners, because they focus on particular aspects, uh, their journey had been challenging. But still, when we are able to convince the court with a reasonable scientific tools and ends, the technique is being widely accepted. Moving forward, my friend asks me, so when we talk about fingerprints and when we talk about uh, the right against self-incrimination, which is stated as a right under Article 23 of Indian Constitution, Clause 3 of Article 20 declares that no person accused of any offense shall be compiled to be a witness against him. So there are not many debates thoroughly on whether or not we can compile or force a suspect or a victim or any subject for uh, controls or standards. So friends, to answer this question, the court by the majority that was stated by Madras High Court held that if fingerprints are taken by police during the course of investigation, which was later produced at a trial, did not amount to testimonial compulsion under Article 23 and was admissible in as an evidence. Soon after that, we saw some sort of deliberations by Law Commission of India also. And Law Commission of India likewise observed that provisional allowing examination of body parts have a chance of passing through the courts for scrutiny under Article 23. And such arrangements which permits the examination of body would uncover important evidence. And thus, it won't be hit by the privilege of self-incrimination. So this was later on clarified by Law Commission of India. And pertaining to that, on several different occasions, there were many guidelines which were been issued from time to time by Law Commission of India. And that took over the privilege on this particular debate. So uh, with this, uh, I would uh, you know, uh, rest my presentation for the day with uh, one quote that physical evidence cannot be intimated. It does not forget. It sits there and waits to be detected, preserved, evaluated, and explained. 
and it is only a matter of uh, uh, the pride and it is a matter of a cautiousness with which we need to present before the apex court and uh, when we are able to do it with a uh, scientific and uh, legal knowledge it makes as a pure uh, techno legal combination and which is a requirement of a day or a need of an hour thank you